96.3 FM, The Source. Twenty-four minutes before eleven o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. I don't usually do this. I think I've done this once before. But in order to introduce you to our next guest, I am going to read from the Amazon listing of the book. The book is called Little Sister: A Memoir. It's written by our guest, and she's on the phone, Patricia Walsh Chadrick. She's a mentor for middle school girls at Our Lady Queen of Angels School in Harlem. Uh, she's the founder and CEO of Anchor Health Initiative. She has a 30-year career in the investment business, and she's an author and a very accomplished author. Her book, again, Little Sister, let me just read from the Amazon listing. It says, imagine an 18-year-old American girl who has never read a newspaper, watched television, or made a phone call. An 18-year-old girl who has never danced, and this is the 1960s. Huh? Did yes. I get your attention with just that one line? Yes. Uh, let's find out about this. Uh, Patricia Walsh Chadwick. Good morning, Patricia. Thank you so much for being on the show with us. Good morning. Where are you? I'm in Connecticut. You're in Connecticut. All right. Uh, how's the weather today? Uh, it's sunny, but I'm sure chillier than where you are. <laughs> it was a little chilly here this morning. I think it was like 53. How cold was it there? Actually, not too bad. I think it was 44. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so t tell me about this. So you are the, the, this is your memoir. It is. And you didn't, I wrote, yep. you, you didn't watch TV or make a phone call and you were 18 in the 60s, huh? <laughs> yes. The 60s may seem like a long time ago, but it's pretty vivid to no, me. No, not to me. We're old, too. Don't worry. We're in the same boat. So, But except I did watch TV in the 60s. I, I, don't, know, I don't know what I would have done without TV in the 60s, actually. How did that happen for you? Well, I was part of a religious community that was uh, secluded from the rest of the world very deliberately so that we would not be influenced by the evil forces of the world, if that's one way of describing it. And uh, we were kind of formed over the dogma that is a Catholic dogma that says if you don't belong to the Catholic Church, you will not go to heaven, or more importantly, you will go to hell. Okay. So, and, uh, go ahead. Well, I'm just curious if you ever caught up on Gilligan's Island. I mean, did you catch up? <laughs> <laughs> I did catch up uh, eventually, but I certainly, when I was forced to leave the organization, I was a neophyte in the ways of the world. I knew literally nothing. I had never heard of Frank Sinatra. I, I had, as I say, used read. I'd never been in a supermarket. I had never really engaged people socially. Wow. And I didn't even know the language. I had never heard slang, much less a swear word. So I was really out on my own. Where was this? Where did this happen? It was in, of all places, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Okay. Which is an intellectual hub. And then we moved a little bit west into the middle of Massachusetts. So but it was all very much in the Northeast. So I don't, I don't ever remember a Catholic telling me these things. Was it a certain sect? Or was, it, was it like Amish or something? What was it? Well, we were, we were excommunicated. And in fact, if you lived in the Boston area, we were referred to as Feniites. And Feniites was a very derogatory term. And it referred to the man, the priest, the Jesuit, now then excommunicated priest, Father Leonard Feeney, who ran the organization, and his cohort, if that's the right way to describe her, was a woman named Catherine Clark, and she became Sister Catherine, and she was really m even more than the power behind the throne. It was her vision, her mission, that these 39 children who were born into this uh, organization and the 60 adults, which included 12 couples who were coerced to forego their vows of uh, marital vows in replace it with a vow of celibacy, but her mission was that what? all the 39 children would actually become nuns and dedicate their lives to God in a, in a life of celibacy. Wow. And what if you broke that vow? I mean, what if you vowed celibacy and you had a night and you said, whoa, I messed up. Would, would you be well, done? Are they, what do they do to you? Well, my parents did not want 
to take that vow, not surprisingly. Uh, I was the oldest of five children. My siblings were all together in a group of six years, and my mother said she was hoping to have 12 children. And they most assuredly did not want to do it. But once they made that decision, they were faithful to it. They did tell me they thought that if they had not agreed to it, they would have been asked to leave. And one might say, well, what would be so bad about that? except they felt that very strongly that we would get the best Catholic education mm. by staying there, and so they made the sacrifice. So you just weren't raised by your parents. There were all these other adults that raised you, and you wrote that you had to change your name. That's right. We were all in, in very much along the lines of what happens in religious orders. Somewhere around the time I was five, all the adults had their names changed, and then I did, and I so loved my name. I wanted to keep my name of Mary Patricia. And Father Feeney came along one day, and he changed it to Anastasia, which was my name until I was picked out at the age of 17. Was, is there anything from your upbringing that you are glad about? Is there, like, it sounds like so far it's all things none of us would want to have to go through. But at the same time, we all wonder if maybe if if we didn't have so much TV or if we in today's world, maybe we didn't have the Internet, maybe things would be better. Is there anything that you think actually was contributing to the person you are today that you're glad about? Oh, there are many things. And this is not a mommy dearest story. It is an anguished story in certain ways. Okay. But the very fact that my own family, my own parents, most particularly my father, would break the rules to let me know that he loved me was a very powerful force showing me that my parents loved me and we loved each other. That, those little things, my father wiggling his little finger at me, or whispering, happy birthday, my little princess, when we don't, didn't, weren't even allowed to celebrate birthdays. Oh, really? Uh, those things were powerful. And extremely important so that when we all finally came back as a family when I was in my early 20s uh, there was no anger but there were other things when you live in a community with so many people like that you you really relish that family I have friendships that have remained those uncles and aunts as I described them the big brothers and sisters were very much a part of my family and despite the fact that I uh, am dismayed and, and was dismayed about what Father and Sister Catherine uh, did to the community, I have never had anger towards the other people in the community. Well, that's good. Uh, yeah. Were you able to be self-sufficient when you were kicked out of the, 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 the cult? How did you survive? Well... My, well I, you know, again, credit to the organization. I had a, a classical but very um, good education. I had been accepted at Vassar and Bates College only to see, to prove to the state of Massachusetts that our school should be accredited. I wasn't allowed to go to them. But I had a tool set, as I like to refer to it. Um, I had roots, but I had no wings. And so I had to be cautious in how I got myself through the world, and I did it in by observing and not speaking very much. But I also had a drive. I was a, had to be accountable up there. I applied that. I, I think that there was, I had an, a really strong work ethic, whether that was innate or, or some, somehow conditioned by the environment that we lived in. I was supportive of people there, and I think that carried on. So it took a while for me to be able to feel comfortable and I certainly never spoke about, you know, my past life there because, particularly while I lived in the Boston area, to even be con associated with the center would be to be be identified as a Feeneyite, which was absolutely the last thing right, I wanted right. to do. Did, did the, uh, the the leadership of of the Feeneyites did they? justify some of their things in an intellectual way uh, for example cel celibacy i mean how does how do you justify that and use use the bible as as your as your reference there's nothing in the bible that says you can't have sex no i i, I don't think it is remotely justified um, by anything in the bible but did I they try to 
No, the, the way we were approached as children is we were told that we were the luckiest children in the world because from our birth we had been dedicated to God and that our lives, our role in life was as a woman, as a nun, would be to become the bride of Christ. And I had no interest in being the bride of Christ. <laughs> I, <really, laughs> I wanted to be the bride of somebody, but somebody that was tactile. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Uh, you had, uh, there was a Sister Catherine in your life. And I had, you, I'm sorry, you had the, the role of Sister Catherine in my life? Yes, you, you had uh, Sister Catherine in your life, and at times it seems she was your 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 ne your nemesis trying to uh, mold you into something that you didn't want to become. Oh, really? The vision and the mission, I really believe, became Sister Catherine's. And it was she who wanted us all to live this monastic life. And at around the age of 13 or 14, in a very normal way, I started becoming interested in boys. But the boys there, the little brothers, were for the most part younger than I and wasn't particularly, I wasn't attracted to anyone that much younger than I. And I, so my, my fascination got shifted to the grown men who were all 20 years older than I, but there wasn't any happy medium. And uh, Sister Catherine did her best to, you know, excoriate me, which she did often, and try to mold my life so that I would somehow have these crushes wrung out of my system. But it didn't work. Mm -hmm. And eventually she realized uh, that she couldn't mold me. And she claimed to others that I was destroying the vocations of the big brothers and the little brothers. Oh and my that gosh. She kicked me out. And why wasn't there a group of boys between those ages, where did they go? No, I was one of the oldest children, so there were 39 children. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the book I talk about uh, Leonard Maloof, who was my best chum as a little tiny child. But when I got 12, 13, 14, uh, I wasn't, it didn't appeal to me. I, uh, there was always a, more like a brother friendship. And the next older, the next line of boys was a year and a half, two, three younger. Well, I'm 13. I don't think too many girls are too interested in 11-year-old boys. No, so, no. <laughs> so I, you know, the only other, there were some pretty charming big brothers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ended up having a variety of crushes on them. Was there, uh, uh, two questions in one, was there a democratic mm -hmm. pr uh, procedure for getting leadership into place or getting leadership out of, out of position? And, and did uh, the laws of the land, the laws of Boston, for example, uh, were they respected? And, and if, if, if Boston made a law or the state of Massachusetts made a law, did you all abide by those laws or did you have your own little governing thing? No, we, we would certainly abide by the laws. I mean, we got our driver's licenses and we, you know, whatever was required, I have no idea. We we're tax exempt, but we would pay a stipend to the town. Uh, so in that regard, it was very, we were law-abiding. Um, I'm sorry, just remind me of the first part, which I wanted to answer. Uh, uh, as, far, as far as electing people who were... Oh, yes. Yeah, did that happen? <laughs> Absolutely not. No, okay, the, I didn't think so. The two leaders, Father Feeney and Sister Catherine, as I write in the book, were almost like deities to me. They sat on a pedestal so much higher than the rest of us. We oh all gosh. ate on calamine plates and sat on refectory tables and they had linen and you know beautiful stemware and in fact I came to discover years years later that the silver that I would polish for their table was actually a wedding present to my parents oh my oh my um, I just looked up Leonard Feeney um, so so did your parents um regret getting involved with this in the first place? I guess it was all done. Did they uh, feel like they had made a big mistake and, and subjected you to something they were regretful for? The regret that came uh, was only when they discovered after Sister Catherine died that physical abuse, punishment had been very um, stern and severe and they were completely unaware of it and people, some people will say how could they have been unaware? 
But when you're not allowed to talk to your parents and when you're only given 45 minutes every three or four or five months to gather and you're, there are five children there and they're all trying to talk about their horseback riding lessons or their you know, grades in school, you don't usually get down to the point where, mm. oh, and I was beaten you know, five times last week. So they were truly oblivious. And for that, they were enormously um, dismayed when they discovered So, it. I don't understand. I mean, it says here he went to Oxford, he went to Harvard. How did he... What, what changed his view of life as, as to how people should live? I mean, I'm, I'm just going to take a stab at this, that this guy thought he was doing a good thing. I don't know. Am I right that he thought he did? It, well, he, yes, he became, I think, really quite radicalized. It was after the uh, bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki that he took a turn and said, you know, the human values, morals were decrepit in the United States, and he started blaming the faculties of universities, and it, and it kind of metamorphosed from that into this dogma and supporting this dogma, and if you weren't part of that, because the way I was brought up, everyone outside of our community was, was condemned. And we were the only people who were going to be saved and it, it pretty soon, I think he began to, um, I'm, I'm maybe interpreting this wrong, but there was a certain narcissistic quality that uh, you obeyed him, you said yes to him, and this power just grew and grew. But she was the power behind the throne, and eventually she overwhelmed him completely. And as she became more and more powerful, he became... Um, more and more docile. The book is called Little Sister. It's a memoir by our guest, Patricia Walsh Chadwick. Um, I found it on Amazon, by the way. Yes, yesterday was the release date, so it's brand new. Did, it was. Did, what are your religious views today? Well, I consider myself Catholic, certainly um, a liberal Catholic, sure, uh, but it has not turned me off on the Catholic Church, and I've tried to write about that. And all, a lot of that can be found on my website, which is Patricia Chadwick. Com. Okay. And uh, when you uh, were forced out of the order and then you started building your life on the outside, uh, how did you know how to act around the opposite sex and have dates and things like that? Well, cautiously and timidly. And mm -hmm. I was very um, wary that people would... Um, abuse me, but I truly walked out of there, honestly, not even knowing how a baby was made. So uh, I kind of self-taught when I stayed with my aunt's house, and I, I write about that in the book, and there was a Dr. Spock book, and I kind of read that, and thought, oh, now I know certain things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. So, okay, I have a question that maybe is a difficult one, but I'm guessing every talk show host is going to ask this at some point. And so forgive me if it's if it's not the, a good one, but it seems whenever we hear about cults, there's usually somebody in leadership that is dictating what sexual behavior you must abide by, and they don't abide by it. Was with was the leadership, the men and the women, were they taking advantage of the young girls in the in the group sexually, or or did they stay? Did they keep the noses clean in that, in that regard? This was a very asexual place. I mean, the sex se separation of boys, girls, men, and women was a part of Sister Catherine's mission, in a sense, uh -huh. to dedicate us to God, hoping that God would replace other interests. But uh, most assuredly, in talking to my own parents, once they took that vow, you know, it never happened. Now, that being said, there was abuse of a very different sort. There was obviously some mental abuse, but there was also physical abuse. It was a time... That, that was much more common, and it's certainly not today, and couldn't get away with those things. But um, rules were, you know, often and many, and they were enforced rigidly. W were you, um, w was the group, and, and maybe as the, and indirectly, were you um, encouraged to be racist in any way? I know that word is tossed around a lot these days, but... You probably know what I mean, especially if you taught in Harlem. I mean, were you taught that uh, if you were Catholic, it didn't matter what race you were, that that was still a good thing? Or, or And were Jewish people uh, frowned upon? I mean, how did all of those things get taught in that group? 
Yes, well, very much Jewish people were castigated for having killed Jesus. And even as a little eight-year-old, I used to think, but that was 2,000 years ago. Oh, really? Still be. Good for you, yeah. Bad for this, yeah. But apart from that, uh, there was, out of the 100 people, the 99 people or so that were there, one was an African-American woman, and she was a brilliant woman. She had um, gone to uh, Radcliffe and had graduated in three years, and from there, she um, got her master's degree, and she taught English in our high school. And I remained close to her. The very beginning of my book is a conversation with her. And she was one of my most favorite people. That being said, I do believe there was racism there, because I had asked one of the big sisters, I think it was 1964, uh, and I asked her if she was going to wo- vote for Ed Brooks. He was running a senator from Massachusetts, and he was an African-American. And she said, no, because he is a Negro. Now, that is just, I'm telling you that story, and that's right out of my head, and that is not in my book. I do not want to say, though, that we were ever taught that um, any, any, there was no teaching of racist. I got you. There were individual racist um, elements, but we were certainly taught that the Jews were wicked. Oh really? Oh my gosh! It's such an interesting story. So t- tell me again about your your siblings. How many brothers and sisters do you have? I have three sisters and one brother, all younger than I am. And how are they doing? Wonderfully. So oh. all five of us have been married and uh, have children, and now grandchildren. Not I. My mine are still in their twenties. But um, we are very very close. My mother died. Last uh, September, mm. she was a couple of months shy of her 90th birthday. She read every chapter of my book, every line. She supported it. She said some of it made her sad, but she said, mm-hmm. you need to publish it. Yeah, I, b- I bet you some very, did. Very Wow, what a great story you have to share with us. Uh, again, the book is called Little Sister. I found it on Amazon, and I also went to your website. Let me repeat what that is. It's patriciachadwick.com. It's spelled exactly as it sounds. Uh, Patricia, thank you so much for being on the show with us today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Really great interview. We'll be right back. Experience the largest aerospace expo in the South as Sun and Fun returns to the skies of Lakeland April 2nd through 7th. It's not just an air show, it's everything aviation. Walk among hundreds of aircraft, browse over 500 exhibits and activities, then be amazed at daily air shows with breathtaking aerobatic flights by the world's top pilots featuring the U.S. Navy Blue Angels. See dozens of mighty warbirds fly from vintage bombers to modern fighter jets and feel the heat of a 1,000-foot wall of fire. Florida residents buy a ticket for Saturday April 6th and get Sunday, April 7th for free. Come all day Saturday and stay for the night air show with its amazing star dance spectacular drone light show, aerobatic flyers, plus a fireworks display. Then return Sunday for an additional show. That's three shows for the price of one. Make plans now to bring the whole family and experience the past, present, and future of aviation at the Sun and Fun International Fly-In and Expo. Children under 10 free. For additional ticket information and show schedules, visit us at flysnf.org. In my life, I've learned an important lesson. My age doesn't define who I am. I do. Comfort Keepers believes in the power of joy and purpose at any age. In my life, there is a Comfort Keeper. Comfort Keepers, elevating the human spirit. A gorgeous day is in store for the area Wednesday with sunshine and a high of 72 right at the coast, 77 inland. Mainly clear Wednesday night, lows in the low to mid 50s inland, low 60s along the coast. Sunshine mixing with clouds Thursday, another gorgeous day with a high of 77 along the coast, 82 inland. It'll be warm Friday with more clouds and sun. Watch out for a shower or even a thunderstorm, especially in the afternoon. High 81 at the coast, 86 inland. From the Florida Weather Center, I'm meteorologist Joe Lundberg. Broadcasting from the Paddock Mall Studios, this is WOCA, Ocala, Gainesville, The Villages, 1370 AM, 96.3 FM. Fox News, I'm Chris Foster. Democrats on the House Judiciary Committee have just voted to authorize subpoenas for the entire special counsel Russia report and the underlying evidence. Congress is entitled to all of the evidence. Chairman Jerry Nadler from New York, Georgia Republican Doug Collins. This is reckless, it's irresponsible, and it's disingenuous.